Hi guys. Okay, in this video, I'm going to go through uh, just the first half of the first section of the uh, lecture slides I've uploaded as uh, lecture three. So we're going to be doing the section on the language of TFL. I'll record some uh, videos later on going through some of the examples of uh, English things you could symbolize in TFL uh, in subsequent videos. Okay, so what are what am I doing in this lecture? Here's the question that I'm going to try and answer. The question is, what are the rules for forming grammatical sentences of TFL? Or if you like, which strings of symbols are grammatical or well-formed sentences of TFL? Okay. Ultimately, you're going to need to be able to do more than just create grammatical sentences. You, you want to be able to um, symbolize English sentences in our formal language. I said in the, in the very first lecture, that's one of the main skills you're going to need to learn in this class. It's one of the things I'm going to test you on in the midterm and the exam. What does that mean, symbolizing English sentences in TFL? That means producing TFL sentences that have the same truth conditions, that are true under the same circumstances as the original English sentence. But here, we're not worrying about that quite yet. In this lecture, we're not worrying about what a given sentence of TFL means, under what circumstances it's true. We're just trying to figure out how do I put the symbols together according to the rules that say I have said anything at all, right? If you want to say the right thing, first you have to make sure um, you are saying something. Okay, maybe an analogy with um, uh, thinking about natural languages helps. So if you're learning uh, how to speak a, a second language, or I guess a first, but I don't know how babies work. Anyway, if you're learning a second language, um, you need to learn not only like the nuances of uh, of the different constructions you can come up with, the, uh, the little subtle flavorings of meaning and how they differ from something else, um, but you also have to learn just like the, the basic building blocks. Like if you're if you're learning to write English, you have to learn, you know, the difference between nouns and verbs um, that in English, the word order matters. You have to typically we have subject, verb, object, that kind of thing. Other languages, you learn other things. Um, yeah, different languages do different things. Um, German does different things with word order than English does. Um, Latin lets you put words in all kinds of places, but you have to do funny things to the endings to make sure that they um, serve the right purpose. Okay, similarly in TFL, there are rules about how you're allowed to string um, symbols together. So let's start here. So first thing, a first way that something could fail to be a grammatical sentence of TFL is just if it includes symbols that are not in the vocabulary of TFL. This is a formal language, so we give you a uh, here's something we can do that you can't do in, say, English. We can give you a definite list and say, these are all of the symbols. If you have anything other than this showing up, then it's not a sentence of TFL. You can't do that in English because people like replace words with eggplants or um, less rude kinds of foodstuffs. Um, like, yeah, English is a lot more flexible. But TFL, because this is a made up language, we can say, no, it's just this list. So what's on the list? Well, for one thing, here's something you had in the previous lecture. We've got these five connectives. Those are definitely going to feature. So you have not, or, and, if, then, if, and only if. Um, but what's going to actually appear in the in fully symbolized sentences of TFL is just those symbols that appear at the end of each of these lines. Uh, just by the way, to give you a little bit more terminology than we had last time. So last time I gave you these special names for sentences that um, feature each of these connectives, negation sentences, disjunctions, conjunctions, conditionals. Um, we also have names for the parts of those sentences in some cases. So an or sentence is a disjunction. If you have a sentence like A or B, then the A and the B, the things that appear on either side of the or sign, we call the disjuncts. Likewise, an and sentence is a conjunction. The two things that are glued together with the and connective we call conjuncts. Um, and with conditional sentences, that is if then sentences, first of all, remember that uh, this is the one asymmetric 
um, connective here. All the other ones, so like A or B, uh, says the same thing as B or A. But if A then B says something different from if B then A. One of those could be true while the other one is false. So for that reason, it matters which one is at the tail, if you like, of the arrow and which one's at the head of the arrow. And we have different names for those two things. So if you have something like if A then B, then A is the antecedent and B is the consequent. Okay, those things are, those words are worth memorizing, um, particularly antecedent and consequent, uh, because even outside of logic, those are very standard in uh, and commonly used in at least Anglophone philosophy. You will often see regular old philosophers, um, even ones who think they are not doing logic at all, um, use terms like antecedent and consequent. Okay, so that's the first thing. We've got those five connectives. Let me give you that complete list of symbols in our language. So here are all of them. First of all, uh, so we had the connectives. I, I mentioned that last time when I was telling you like there are two main things to get your head around in uh, the language of TFL. The two things were connectives and atomic sentences. So let's start there. Here's how we symbolize atomic sentences in TFL. We have capital letters. Okay, let me say a little bit about that. Um, so why do we just have big letters instead of like writing out the sentences? like English sentences, say maybe in brackets to show this is a complete unit and shouldn't be split up. Um, remember that our language, when we're thinking about validity, we care about the form of an argument rather than its content. The particular atomic sentences that an argument involves uh, probably have to do with its content rather than its form. So remember those arguments like if Socrates was a philosopher, then he wasn't a historian. We'd rather write that as if A then B, rather than if philosopher then historian, because the important thing for the logical form here is, well, the special logical words like if then, those we're gonna represent with connectives, and the patterns of repetition of the atomic sentences. So what matters isn't that this is an argument about philosophers and historians, but that, well, you've got a sentence about Socrates being a philosopher that appears as the antecedent of a conditional premise, and then that appears again as, I don't know, a premise or a conclusion, depending on where you're looking at it. So our way of keeping track of that is we just take out all the content, all that stuff about philosophers, about historians, take it all out and just replace it with something that doesn't carry any content, but still tracks the pattern of repetition. So if I have if A then B as my premise, and I want to show that, that the antecedent of that conditional premise shows up somewhere else, then I use an A again. Um, maybe you're the kind of person who worries, but we might run out of letters. What if I have an argument that has more than 26 things repeating? Um, the designers of this language thought of that, and we say, if you somehow run out of letters, um, you can start putting numerical subscripts on them. So A1, B1, A297, um, or some even larger number, those are all allowed. And those count as different atomic sentences. Okay. One thing I want to mention quickly, your textbook will talk about this. Um, the, the, what do you call it? Typeface, not the font, but the typeface that I use for these things matters. So when I write a capital italic Roman letter here, italic, Roman, italic, it's just italic. It's not another thing as well, then this is a name for a specific atomic sentence. We'll talk about how you figure out which one it stands for later, but this stands for one particular sentence. The textbook and my slides in a moment will sometimes use, instead of a regular italic typeface, they'll use like a scripty typeface. When we're using a scripty typeface, that's supposed to be like a blank that can be filled by any grammatical sentence. Okay, if it's just italic, it must be atomic. So something like what I've written on this line, those are definitely atomic sentences. We will sometimes see scripty capital letters A or capital letter B. Um, and that can that's supposed to be a placeholder that can be replaced with anything, something that might even not be atomic. It has to be a sentence, but it might be complex. 
Wow, I'm going through this slowly. Okay, let's let's move on. So we have atomic sentence letters. Uh, we have brackets or parentheses if you want to call them that. Um, there is no difference in meaning between round brackets and square brackets. It's just sometimes if you have a, a whole lot of brackets in a sentence, it can be easier to see which ones pair with which if you make some of them round and some of them square. So, uh, and then we have our five connectives. And that's it. That's it. Those are all the symbols. If you have anything other than these symbols in, um, and uh, uh, what, blah, 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 blah. if you're trying to write a sentence of TFL, and you have any symbol that is not among the ones I've listed here, you have failed. It will not be a grammatical sentence. Oh, a little bit of terminology. Um, I'll sometimes say woof. Wait, that sounds funny. Sometimes instead of sentence, I will write WFF, which is pronounced woof. Um, that's short for well-formed formula. Um, is there a difference between well-formed formulas and sentences? In TFL, no. Elsewhere, uh, probably not. Why am I using this term instead of sentence? Because um, it's what I grew up with and because it's uh, quicker to write down on an exam if I want to say not a woof. That takes makes my hand cramp less than writing not a sentence. Um, the textbook doesn't use, the current edition of the textbook doesn't use that term. But yeah, well-formed formula, well-formed sentence. It just means like formed according to the rules of the grammar. Okay, so here I'm going to give you your uh, rules the grammar, we just had the vocabulary, here are the allowable symbols. Now I'm going to tell you, here are the rules for putting those symbols together in a way that uh, produces grammatical sentences, things that actually say something. Once you figure out how to say something in TFL, then you can figure out how to say the thing you want to say. So I'm going to give you a bunch of explicit rules. Those explicit rules are going to be several of them, but they're going to come in three groups. So here's group one. Here's a rule that just says, here's a list of some things that are grammatical sentences all by themselves. So any atomic sentence is a well-formed formula. Any atomic sentence is a woof. So take any one of those atomic sentence letters, put it down by itself, you have a grammatical sentence. You have said something, something that can be true or false. Okay, that's group one. Group one just tells you here are some things that are well-formed formulas. Group two is going to say, suppose you have some well-formed formulas already. Here's how you can add something to those grammatical sentences you already have to get new grammatical sentences. And we're going to get one rule for each connective. So here's, the, here's one of those scripty things. So here's the negation rule. It says, if scripty A is a well-formed formula, then not scripty A is also a well-formed formula. What does that mean? That means, well, so think of this scripty thing as like a blank that needs to be filled with, uh, that can be filled with any sentence, any woof, any grammatical sentence. This scripty A is also a blank that can be filled with any grammatical sentence, but it has to be the same as the one before. That's why it's the same letter. Um, so let's try putting applying this thing in practice. Um, so the first rule says the atomic sentence A all by itself, that's a well-formed formula. So now I can plug this sentence, you know what, actually let me use a different letter just so that the difference between the scripty A in the negation rule and the uh, atomic sentence letter is clear. So take another letter. Here's a very fine letter R. That stands for an atomic sentence. Um, R is a well-formed formula because that's an atomic sentence letter. Rule one tells us that's a well-formed formula. Now let's try inserting that atomic sentence, that well-formed formula into rule two, the, the negation rule. That rule says if scripty A is a well-formed formula, then not scripty A is a well-formed formula. So if I plug this well-formed formula R in there, then we get something that says, if R is a woof, then not R is a woof. So that tells me this sentence is a woof, not R. That is also a well-formed formula. But now I can take that whole thing and plug it into the negation rule. If I plug not R in for the scripty A, that blank, then we get if not R is a well-formed formula, which it is, then not not R is a well-formed formula. 
So this second application of the rule tells me this thing, not not r, is a well-formed formula. And I can just keep chaining those things together. Now I have this whole thing, not not r, I can plug that in for, um, for the scripty a in the rule. And that'll tell me that this is a well-formed formula and so on and so on and so on. So point is, the point for the moment is um, when you see one of these scripty letters in a rule or something like that, that may be atomic, it may not be. It's a sentence because we're saying, well, if these things are well-formed formulas, so let's assume that you've put some kind of grammatical sentence. It doesn't have to be atomic, but you do have to respect the pattern of repetition. So if you've got, you can pick whatever you want to put in for B, but whatever you put in this occurrence of scripty B, you have to put it there too. Likewise, you can put whatever you want in for A, but you have to put the same thing in for the scripty A over here. You can, if you want, put the same thing in for A and B. So let's see, I figured out <coughs> previously, excuse me, I figured out that A, uh, sorry, that the atomic sentence letter R is a well-formed formula. Now let's try plugging that into this new rule that has two things, right? If A and B are well-formed formulas, then bracket A or B, close bracket, the brackets matter, bracket A or B close bracket is also a well-formed formula. Well, suppose I put R in for the scripty A and also put R in for the scripty B, that's fine. Then that tells me that bracket R or R close bracket is a well-formed formula. This is also allowed. And now I can plug this thing into that rule again Right? Maybe I'll put this whole thing with its brackets into the rule for or again. Let's put that in the A spot. What will I put in the B spot? Uh, maybe I'll put my old friend R in again. Right? I still remember that that's a well-formed formula. So since this is a well-formed formula and that's a well-formed formula, that means bracket the first thing or the second thing, close bracket. It's also a well-formed formula. This whole long thing is a woof. Okay. So you get one of these rules for each of the connectives. Notice that all of the binary connectives, that is all the ones that take, uh, that stick two things together as opposed to the negation, all of those have brackets around them. That's important because when you have a sentence that has multiple connectives, you have to know which one to do first, which one sort of takes priority over the other, right? There's a difference between, well, whatever. We'll get on to differences. Okay. That was group two. I said there were three groups. We have group one tells you just plainly, here's a list of things that are woofs. Group two tells you if a certain kind of thing is a woof, then something else is also a woof. Those two things together um, are going to cover all of the things that are grammatical, that are well-formed formulas. But those two groups of rules don't tell you that something isn't a well-formed formula. Notice that I told you that uh, if you write down something that doesn't ha that includes a, a symbol not on our official list, then it's not a well-formed formula. If you just had these two groups of rules, you wouldn't find that out. We know that a certain number of things are woofs, but there's nothing here saying that anything is not a well-formed formula. So that's group three. Group three says, that's it. It's only things that either are atomic sentences or that can be put together by means of atomic sentences and these connective rules. That's a well-formed formula. Okay, if you're ever not sure that something is a well-formed formula, if you're not sure whether something is a well-formed formula, these rules suggest a way of testing, that is by writing a tree diagram. Let me show you how that works. This is something that um, can be very useful. So let me give you, let's say we have something like, I'm just gonna write down some symbols. Uh, that looked ugly. Uh, arrow, let's say C or D. Where should I put brackets? How about here? And I'll put some brackets on the very outside. I suppose I'm not sure if this is a well-formed formula or not. The kind of tree I say you can draw for any well-formed formula 
is going to break this down by means of working backwards through those rules. We should eventually get down to just atomic formulas, which are things that um, that first rule tells us are well formed. So can I look at this complete sentence or this complete formula here, this string of symbols as being made up of some smaller parts by means of one of our rules? Well, let's see. Here's a connective, an arrow, and it looks like we have bracket something arrow something else close bracket so i'm going to do this here's how we make this into a tree i'm going to draw two branches i'm going to take each of those two things so we have on the left as it looks like an antecedent of this conditional bracket a and b bracket and on the right as a consequent we have bracket c or d close bracket okay now each of those things I should be able to break down by means of the rules. So this was using an arrow rule up here. And now this looks like it's taking atomic sentence A, atomic sentence B, and putting them together by means of an AND rule. So if you take A and B, then the AND rule says you can go bracket A and B bracket, and that uh, gets you a well-formed formula. And now we're down to atomic sentences over here, so that's fine. Likewise, over here, this looks like it's put together by means of C and D, the OR rule. So we have atomic sentence, atomic sentence, atomic sentence, atomic sentence, and then a chain of gluing those atomic sentences together by means of the various connective rules that eventually gets us up to the sentence we started with. So the fact that I can draw a diagram like this, this kind of tree that has... Um, atomic sentences all at the bottom, and each of the sort of branchings together produces um, the things above. Uh, that The fact that I can make a tree like that shows this is a well-formed formula. For any well-formed formula, you should be able to make a tree like this. Okay, and that's going to show us something about uh, why we need brackets and the difference between some of these things. So let's let me give you a little bit of terminology here. The main logical operator of a sentence is the one introduced last in, in constructing the sentence. That is, as you go up this kind of tree, what did you put in last? In this sentence, the arrow came in after the and and the or. It's the very last thing in this last forking together, the last crotch in this tree. It's an arrow. That means that this sentence, its main connective is the arrow. It's a conditional sentence. Okay, let me work through two examples here to show you how um, this kind of tree can show a difference in what's uh, the main logical operator. So even if you're not confused about whether something is grammatical, sometimes, at least initially, uh, early on in this class, you might be confused about which connective is the main logical operator. Now, the two sentences I've put on the slide here, they have exactly the same connectives, the same atomic sentences, but the brackets are put in different places. And those different placements of the brackets make a difference to what's the main logical operator. So let me write this out. Let me erase these things. Okay, I'm going to write these down with some space so we can just move brackets around. So we have a not, we have an A, or B and not C, or B and not C. So the first version of the sentence, we have bracket here, here, close, close. Okay, now, if I try and draw a tree for this, if I look at this thing and try to think, how can I break this down into uh, parts that could have been joined together by means of one of our rules? There's only one option. So all of those uh, all of those rules, all of your grammatical rules, let me actually bring those back up so you can look at them. All of them are either the negation rule, in which case you have negation something, so the negation should be all the way to the left, or they have one of the binary connectives and they have brackets around two things. So in this case, the negation is not all the way to the left. There's a bracket outside it, so I can't get this 
string of symbols by means of the negation rule. On the other hand, if I'm doing one of the um, binary connectives, then we have bracket something binary connective something else. Well, that's not a binary connective. That's not a binary connective. Hey, here's a binary connective. So if I'm doing bracket uh, something connective, something else, close bracket, the only option for the thing, the first thing that I'm joining together is not A. The only option for the second thing is bracket B and not C, close bracket. So in that case, I've got left bracket something connective something else close bracket. So that shows I'm joining these two things together by means of the or. Okay, I can break these things down further. This looks like it's B and not C joined together by an and rule. This is not atomic, but it looks like it's produced from A by means of a negation rule, and that is atomic. This is atomic. That comes from C by a negation rule, and now that's atomic. So now I have a complete tree. So I'm sure that this is a well-formed formula, and now that the tree is complete, I can say the main logical operator is that or. Okay, let's back up. I think I can just hit undo a bunch of times. That's probably more useful than other things. Let's do the other version of the sentence. So the one we just did was with the brackets here. Now let's move that bracket, that leftmost bracket. Let me put the negation back, put it here. Now we have something different. Now we do have something where there's a negation all the way to the left. So this could be from the negation rule. And in fact, it can't be produced by any of those binary connective rules because the binary connective rules all have a bracket on the left-hand side. So this could come from bracket A or bracket B and not C bracket bracket by means of the negation rule. And then this thing we could break down by a plus bracket B and not C by the OR rule. And this could be B plus, I'm running out of space here, B plus not C by an AND rule. And this comes from C by a negation rule. And then we've got atomic, atomic, atomic. Okay, so that's a complete diagram. And now we can see it's the negation that's the main logical operator here. So we had a difference in main logical operators. This is a sentence that says, that thing in the brackets here is false. That's what the negation does. It says, whatever is in here is not true. Whereas the other sentence, let me just come over here. This sentence says, well, it's an or sentence. So it says either this thing is true or this thing is true. I don't know which. In fact, as we'll see, maybe it's both, but at least one of those two things is true. I don't know which. This one says something different. It says whatever's in the brackets is not true. Okay, we will continue to work on what the differences between those things are. Um, there's a bit of terminology. I'm not going to go over it. We might use it at some point. Okay, that's it for now. Those are all the rules for telling whether and when something is um, a well-formed formula, how to tell what its main logical operator is, Maybe you'll feel like these, uh, the trees I'm doing here to test the structure of uh, a sentence, maybe that'll feel like overkill for some of you. Next week, when we learn rules for determining when a sentence of TFL is true or false, these might become helpful again. We will wind up using them. Um, if we could all be together in person, I would have you play a board game. I'm going to have to figure out how to make that work. Yeah, okay, that's it for now. I will talk to you soon, and we'll do some examples.